Welcome back to Myth and Human Culture. If you remember our last lecture, we were talking about um, trickster heroes. We did a little bit of an introduction to creation myths, and then we focused most of the time on the trickster hero. And we're going to follow that up today by getting into our very first collection of stories that involve trickster heroes. And they also happen to be myths that deal with the creation. Okay, so we're going to start actually in the Near East, the ancient Near East. Uh, particularly looking at the myths of Babylon and Israel as found in the Hebrew scriptures. And after that, we're going to get into the story of Osiris, Isis, and Horus from Egypt. That's actually going to be the next lecture in the series. But as far as your assignments go um, in the course, you should have been reading all three of those stories in preparation. Okay, so today I want to get going with an introduction to Babylonian mythology in a very basic way. We're not going to be spending a lot of time in ancient Babylon, which is kind of a shame, but we're going to be looking at creation, conflict, and cunning. Creation myths of Babylon and Israel. And I'm going to do what I usually do as I introduce new stories, is go back and give a little bit of a background for the culture before we actually get into the stories. And since you were supposed to read these stories, I'm not going to cover every single part of them. I'm going to kind of hit the highlights and try to draw your attention to certain motifs, to certain themes, uh, maybe unpack some of the functions, some of the things that are going on in the story that you may have missed. So it's always good to go back and review kind of the introduction to hero myths, or rather the introduction to mythology, where we talk about things like myth interpretation, function, um, and those types of things. So let's move on and get into a little bit of the introduction. What you see is a map focusing on the areas that we're going to be going to today. So um, you've got the area that's known as Mesopotamia, where you see the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley. That's the earliest um, civilization that we have uh, sprang up back, or, you know, actually back around 4,000 to 3,500 BC in the southern portion of Mesopotamia, which is known as Sumeria. On the map, you see the cities of Uruk, Ur, Nippur. Um, those were really important Sumerian setters, particularly the city of Uruk early on. That's, um, in most accounts, the first city in world history, not necessarily the first settlement, of course. People in, existed in you know towns, villages, and other types of settlements long before cities developed. But when we get to ancient Sumeria, we have a civilization, we have uh, cities, city-states. Going a little bit to the uh, north, actually the north west, as you move up through Mesopotamia, you get to the city of Babylon, and that's where we're going to stop briefly, because Babylon is going to be the place where the god Marduk was supreme. And the creation myth of the Enuma Elish, which is the one that you guys should have read, is going to focus on the rise of Marduk and his position, or his coming into position as the supreme god. Okay. The other culture that we're going to touch on today is the culture of the ancient Israelites, uh, the Hebrews. And I have the spot marked on the map for you where Jerusalem is. Um, that region basically is the Levant. Uh, it was known as ancient Canaan. And we're going to cover those areas. And there was definitely contact between those areas, which you see marked in the colorful area on the map um, is essentially what's called the Fertile Crescent, right? You've got the Tigris and Euphrates River Valley coming up from the um, Persian Gulf, and then you have the Jordan River Valley going down um, the Levant, back down to the Dead Sea, okay? So let's start by going through a little bit of a background for ancient Babylon. Uh, rough, rough historical sketch. This is a very, very basic timeline. Uh, the ancient Sumerian civilization, which was the earliest civilization, starts to collapse around 2000 BC. And again, the date's going to be very general. The further back you go, uh, the less precise they are. But we know that the uh, Sumerians collapsed due to several factors. War with the region of Elam, which was to the east of Babylon, or sorry, to the east of Sumeria, and also migrations of new Semitic tribes into the region known as the Amorites. So the Amorites around 2000 BC come in and settle down at various centers from Damascus and Syria all the way into um, northern Mesopotamia and then down to places like Babylon. So you have Babylonian um, occupation by the Amorites around that time. When you get to the 18th century, approximately from 1792 to about 1750, the famous King Hammurabi ruled. 
And he is, of course, most famous for his code, his law code. But he also created what is known today as the old Babylonian or the Akkadian, sorry, not the Akkadian Empire, that would be an earlier Sumerian Empire, um, the um, Amorite Empire of ancient Babylon. Okay, um, He didn't conquer all of Mesopotamia, but by the time of his grandson, all of Mesopotamia had come under the sway of Babylon. By the time we get to 1595 or thereabouts, we have a collapse of that empire. Um, The city of Babylon itself is sacked by the Hittites somewhere around 1600, weakening them. And within about a generation or less, you have an influx of Kassites. And the Kassite period is going to last for several hundred years, approximately 1595 to about 1155. And that displaced um, the Amorite Empire and in some ways was kind of a dark period as far as archaeology goes. Around 1155, uh, the Kassite rule of Babylon comes to an end. Elam to the east, Assyria to the north attack Babylon. Elamites themselves actually captured the statue of Marduk, again the supreme god, take it back to their capital at Susa, um, and then not too long later, Nebuchadnezzar the first recaptures that statue and brings it back. That's around 1125 to 1104 would have been the date range for the reign of Nebuchadnezzar the first. This is not the famous Nebuchadnezzar if you're familiar with the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, that's Nebuchadnezzar the second. He's much later. We'll get to him actually just in a second. Between 11th century and 9th century, you've got an influx of new peoples, probably out of the northern portion of Arabia that are known as the Chaldeans. This would be the Chaldean migration. And then from the 9th to the 7th century, Babylon Babylon was under the uh, domination, really, of northern Mesopotamian group known as the Assyrians. Okay, Sennacherib, who ruled from 704 to 681, actually destroyed the city of Babylon. And then his successor, Ashurhaddon, rebuilds the city. Okay. Um, in the ancient world, it's interesting how many times different cities are sacked and destroyed and then rebuilt. Babylon is you know, one of the cities that was rebuilt numerous times and goes through numerous phases of development and expansion. The next phase of real expansion comes under Nebuchadnezzar and his son, the actual famous Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, 625 to 605, Nebuchadnezzar begins the creation of a new Babylonian empire, sometimes known as the Chaldean Empire. And one of the high points early on is the overthrow of Assyrian domination. Nabopolassar, along with allies among the Medes and the Scythians, um, launches an attack on various Assyrian um, city centers, particularly the city of Nineveh, which was the capital at the time. And in 612, he destroys the city. Now, one of the important things about Nineveh at that time is it housed one of the greatest libraries in the ancient world. And thanks to that destruction, that library was destroyed and uh, basically preserved for archaeological um, um, history. 605, uh, Nebuchadnezzar takes the throne. It was probably co-regent with his father for a little while, and he's going to reign for till 562. But in the beginning of his reign, he's consolidating his power, and the Battle of Carchemish, he comes to defeat the Egyptians, who were seeing the opportunity to uh, make a little bit of a resurgence, perhaps build back their empire, which they had, they had lost you know, generations, actually centuries earlier. Anyways, at this time, the kingdom of Israel, which we are going to talk about in a little while, comes under the command or the control of Babylon, becomes a vassal state under Babylon, and... Due to rebellion against Babylon, they end up having the full might of Babylon brought against them. And in 586, Nebuchadnezzar destroys the city of Jerusalem and essentially exiles uh, the Judeans. Um, This is known as the Great Babylonian Captivity, which is going to last until uh, 539, when Babylon itself is finally taken over by the Persians. And the Persian Empire was the biggest of all the ancient Near Eastern empires. Um, we are going to deal with Persia later this semester because we're going to be reading some Persian hero myth, but I will get more into the background for Persia when we get uh, to that story. That's going to be probably several weeks away as far as the lectures go, okay? Um, One thing to note now, perhaps, is that the religion of ancient Babylon was very similar 
to the general polytheistic religion of Mesopotamia that was, you know, developed under the Sumerian times. It's kind of a, a adaptation of Sumerian concepts, gods, and um, ritual. The Persians, on the other hand, seem to be fairly unique. Okay, so we're going to talk about their uh, unique religion later. Whether the Persians at this time, the uh, conqueror of Babylon was Cyrus the Great. We don't really know what his religious positions were, but um, Persia is going to be more connected with a tradition of Zoroastrianism, um, which tends to be on the monotheistic side of the spectrum. Anyways, the Enuma Elish. This is the story. This is the creation epic. Um, the Enuma Elish itself means when on high. This is taken from the first couple lines or, or words uh, opening the poem. Okay, and that's generally how texts in the ancient world would have been known, by their opening lines. Now, originally, the creation myth, like I said, the Babylonians borrowed heavily from the Sumerians, who went before them, and this, the Sumerian myth actually gives us uh, some creation stories involving gods like An, Enlil, Enki, and Ninurta. Some of these gods actually show up in the Enuma Elish, the Babylonian form of the creation epic. So it was adapted, um, it was changed, and the text that we are going to go through is really the later Babylonian or Akkadian version of the story. Now, this story may date back as far as the 19th century BC, possibly to the time of Hammurabi or just prior. And in the story, the focus is going to be on a very different God. And this is a God that would not have shown up in the Sumerian stories earlier. This is the God Marduk. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit more about him as we progress, but there were other versions as well, not just a Sumerian Babylonian version, but the Assyrians had their own account of creation. And of course, instead of Marduk, which was a Babylonian deity, they had their own god in place, which is the god Asher. Okay, that's where the actual name, the Assyrians, comes from. It's the same root. Now, I mentioned the destruction of the library at Nineveh in 612 BC. That city of Nineveh was excavated in the middle of the 18th, 1800s, okay, 19th century. And around 1849, you have the discovery of the text at the library of Nineveh. And the text that we're looking at for the Enuma Elish is basically the Akkadian version. Now, there have been various te texts and tablets that have found, been found since, but the Akkadian version is essentially the one that we're working with, and it probably dates to at least the 7th century BC, possibly a little bit older than that. Obviously, can't be any younger than that, because the library, like I said, was destroyed in 612, which was still in the 7th century. Now, after decipherment, the story was first published in 1876, okay? So, most of the world had no knowledge whatsoever of the creation epic of the Babylonians until the late 19th century. And, of course, we're fortunate enough to be able to study it today. I'll give you a very brief list of the principal characters it's better to kind of talk about the story and introduce them as we go, but I do want you to have a few names in mind, especially because there are lots of names that are thrown at you as you read the text. And I know you are reading an abridged version, which isn't as complicated as the original poetry. Even in translation, the poetry is a little bit more difficult than um, the prose uh, copy that you have in your textbook. But the gods that I want you to pay attention to are going to be these, Apsu. Okay, this is at the first generation. This is the very beginning. He is the primeval father. He is the god of the fresh waters. He's the god of the abyss. He was associated with the Euphrates River. It was kind of where his throne was at the, at the bottom of the deep. His consort was the goddess Tiamat. And sometimes it's hard to even call them god or goddess. I think those are fine. Um, because they're characterized as kind of the ancestors of the gods. But for our you know, purposes, you know, that, that works out all right. Tiamat, on the other hand, was not a freshwater goddess, god, but a saltwater goddess. She is the primeval mother. A lot of times she's characterized as a dragon or a serpent figure. It's not really clear from the text uh, as far as her description. She's described with a tail and various animalistic characteristics. But um, for the most part, people consider her... Um, a basic dragon motif. But she's also a figure of chaos, which I know I talked about last time when we dealt with creation stories. So this is going to be really important. As a matter of fact, it's going to be almost the universal starting point for creation myth, some kind of chaos or chaotic state. And Tiamat's going to be the representative of that. And if you think about it, 
it makes sense that a um, symbol of chaos would be water. Okay, now water, when you look at any type of symbol, can have different ways it can be interpreted. And usually the, the way you interpret a symbol is going to be, first of all, to notice how it's used in the context of the story. So here, for instance, we've got Apsu, Tiamat, a freshwater, saltwater. There's obviously a difference between the two. You can think of the freshwater generally as a source of life, right? We think of water as a symbol of life. But not all water is a symbol of life. It depends on the type of water. Generally, in you know, Semitic poetry and Hebrew poetry and stuff like that, a stream, a well, those types of things would be connected as symbols of life. Uh, on the other hand, when you deal with things like salt water, the sea, or a flood or something that's devastating or um, you know, incapable of sustaining life, I don't think of salt water as the type of water that you're going to drink, right? So that's something that would be more connected with the idea of death. So water can have this dual, really opposite types of um, meaning, right? It could be life, it could be death, but it could also be chaos. And I think that makes great sense when you think of how water is formless. It is not something that has any particular shape. You can't pick it up in your hands and hold on to it. It kind of slips through your fingers. It takes on whatever shape uh, of the container that it's placed within. Right? So water is really a beautiful picture of chaos. And that's where we're starting in the creation stories. We're going to start with chaos. And if you remember from last time, the story is always going to be about the development of cosmos. It's the development um, or, the, or the bringing of order out of that chaos, form out of the formlessness. Okay. The next god that's really important is the god Ea. It was a god of wisdom. He was the son of Anu, who was another god. As a matter of fact, Anu was one of the supreme beings early on in Sumerian religion. He was the uh, patron god of the city of Uruk and a god of the heavens. Ea, even in the Sumerian accounts, was more involved as the creator of man, had a few broader functions. In the story that we're about to go through, he kind of loses some of those functions. Uh, those are transferred to his son Marduk, okay, who is the next one and the most important one for you guys to know. Um, but basically, out of this list, Tiamat and Marduk are the two that you really cannot forget. Um, Marduk is the national god of the, of the Babylonians. You could think of it kind of this way. In the earlier Sumerian uh, empire, uh, Sumerian period, prior to the real rise of Babylon as an empire, the city of Babylon had its own patron god, and that god would have been Marduk. And Marduk would have been a rather insignificant god. Um, probably not worshipped anywhere very far outside of Babylon, if anywhere outside of Babylon. And what happens, particularly during the time of Hammurabi, when Babylon goes from being just one Mesopotamian city to being the capital of a great empire, along with the elevation of the city, goes the elevation of the god. So Marduk becomes the supreme being, becomes the king of all of the other gods. Okay, All of the gods bow to Marduk. And that's exactly what the Enuma Elish is trying to show, which is why some people think the Enuma Elish probably started to develop that far back. Okay, um, In the story, he's the son of Ea. He is a king. He is the creator. He is the one who brings order. And not just um, order in the universe, he's the creator of man as well. The last one I think that I have on this very short list is Kingu. And Kingu is both a son and consort of the dragon Tiamat. He's also going to be the leader of her armies in the battle at the end of the story against Marduk. Okay. So, let's take a look at this idea of creation bringing order out of chaos. Okay, this is potentially an illustration of Marduk and Tiamat. Um, there are other interpretations of what this particular uh, picture represents. But let's talk about this conflict of opposites. I said even with trickster stories, which is really what we're trying to get to, uh, we're going to see this idea of chaos being introduced. And the struggle of opposites is always a big focus in mythology. So here we've got this idea of Marduk versus Tiamat, which is the culminating point of the story. Let me maybe give you a little bit of a background and walk us up to the conflict between Marduk and Tiamat, since I didn't include all of this in the visuals that I'm providing. But in the beginning of the story, remember, we have chaos. We have water. That's where the story begins. There's nothing but water. As a matter of fact, the first opening lines of the tablet, like I said, it means when on high, it actually begins 
by saying, When on high heaven was not named, and the earth beneath did not yet bear a name. And then it introduces us to Apsu. It introduces us to Chaos as Tiamat. And it says these are two different waters that are divided, one salt water, one fresh water. They're gendered. Apsu is male. Tiamat is female. It's an easy way to account for the creation of all the life that springs from them because it's kind of like a genealogy that they're going to give you. And then it goes on to say, when, when of the gods none had been called into being and none bore a name. Okay, over and over again, they get to this idea of namelessness, not having a name, there being no name. Um, it's kind of an interesting beginning. What exactly does that mean? The idea of naming is kind of connected on one level with um, the process of creation. We'll see in some other creation stories, even in the Israelite creation story, and later in the Egyptian creation story, at least some of the Egyptian creation stories, this idea of speaking things into existence. You've heard of, you know, magic spells. If you're a big Harry Potter fan, right, when you say, you know, the, the word the right way, uh, you'll conjure magic. So this is idea that magic and word goes together. Uh, this idea of creating life through speech. Um, that's one hand. So it's like a creative act to name and to call things into being. On the other hand, you could think of names as a sign of order. When you name something, you're, you're, what you're doing is you're recognizing what the thing is, right? You're picking out the essence of the thing. Or you could say you're picking out the form of the thing, if we're going to use Aristotelian terminology again. Okay, so by naming something, I'm um, pointing out the order. I'm pointing out the essence. I'm pointing out the form. So here in the beginning of these stories, when you talk about namelessness, you're talking about a time when really it's kind of prior to creation. It's definitely prior to order. We're still in that chaotic state. Okay, and then as names come into the picture, as things are spoken into existence, of course, order is going to start to form. Right, so that's one way to think of it. I think it's an important way to think of it. I think it's a, it's a good way to think of it. And the other thing that's really interesting about this particular poem is once you get further into the Enuma, at least you're going to get to a point where Marduk is given a certain collection of names. Maybe I should hold off on that a little while um, and then come back to that. But that's important. In the beginning, nothing was named. Okay. And I want to draw your attention back to that idea, or actually don't forget that idea, because when we get to the Hebrew story, I want to point out some things as well that have to do with naming. Anyways, the story goes on. You've got Apsu and Tiamat. They have a number of generations that spring forth from them. And then a problem emerges. And the problem is really with the god Apsu. What you see is the noise created by this new generation of younger gods. Right? When you have creation, you've got life, you've got life, you've got noise. And Apsu wants to go back to the period where it was silent and peaceful. And he's so upset by the noise that the gods are making that he's decided he's just going to wipe them out. He's going to destroy this younger generation of gods. He's going to go to war with them, and he asked Tiamat to support him. Now, Tiamat, in the story, doesn't back him up in the beginning. Right? You can think of her kind of as a mother goddess. Maybe she cares about her children. Uh, that opinion will probably fall away from you as you read on further, but for now, Apsu's on his own. Of course, the gods aren't going to sit back and let Apsu destroy them. So what happens is the god Ea decides to protect the other gods, and he goes into combat and destroys Apsu before Apsu, Apsu can destroy them. Actually makes a, a magic circle around the other gods, a circle of protection, and then he destroys Apsu. Now, with Apsu out of the picture, Tiamat doesn't have a consort, and this is basically where she gets together with her son, Kingu. Now, Kingu wears and controls these things called the Tablets of Destiny, this idea that there is an order, that there is um, an authority that goes along with Kingu. Um, the idea of destiny, fate, this is a kind of a theme that we'll see in lots of cultures, you know, um, it's one of those themes that comes over and over again into mythology, into religion, into philosophy. Um, questions today regarding, you know, free will, determination, all these types of uh, big, weighty topics. Um, they were wrestled with way back in the beginning, right? So you have this idea that there's something about destiny that the gods control. And the wearing of these tablets makes you really the authority over all creation, even though this is really still kind of prior to creation. Now, at some point, Kingu pressures Tiamat and says, you know, the kids are still being noisy. 
you allowed your husband Apsu to be destroyed, and it's really your responsibility to wage war against the children and wipe them out finally. And Tiamat, at this point in the story, decides that she's going to take on that task, and she has this army, right, of serpents and scorpions, all these other kinds of beasts that she gathers together, and she's going to go towards the destruction of her children. And at this point, the gods are terrified. They don't think any of them are capable of withstanding the fury of Tiamat. So they decide to create a new god. Ea creates his son Marduk. And Marduk is going to be twice as powerful as any of the other gods. As a matter of fact, they call him a double god. He's got, you know, two sets of eyes, two sets of ears. Out of his mouth come flames and, and fire that just show his, his raw power. And he is going to do battle against Tiamat. This is the culmination of the action, actually, in the story, right? So Marduk versus Tiamat. Um, the motif I'll point out in just a little bit, but like I said, when you picture Tiamat perhaps in the form of a dragon, you already know where this is going. Cosmos versus chaos. It's celestial order versus celestial struggle. Creation versus destruction. Culture versus nature. Male versus female. Father versus mother. Younger versus older. All of these things are intertwined in this conflict. right? Tiamat represents the earlier generation, the older gods. Marduk the younger. He's the newest one. Marduk is a, a father figure, in a sense. Right? He's a male god. Tiamat is a mother figure. Even though she's a goddess of chaos and the, the sea, you could still think of her in the sense of a, 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 a mother figure, though she doesn't really have the characteristics of, you know, associated with the crops and stuff like that. But she will be associated with the earth, as we'll see very shortly. I think last time we talked about the idea of the mother figure being a symbol of nature, whereas the father figure or the father archetype is associated with culture, right? So all of these things come into conflict. And in the great battle, Marduk uh, is equipped with his weapons. He's got his mace. He's got his bow and arrow. He's got um, the winds. I mean, he is a god who controls the wind. And the scene is him coming against Tiamat and blowing the wind against her and pinning her down and actually blowing her body up, kind of like a balloon when you read the poem. And then taking out his bow, he basically shoots her through the chest and destroys her. And then crushes her skull with his mace. And from her corpse, he fashions the heavens and the earth. This is the creation scene. This is literally the taking of chaos and the fashioning of cosmos. He literally takes what is no form and he gives it form. Okay, I should have brought this uh, visual up a second ago, but the archetypal figures, right? The father represents culture. And there's a positive and a negative side. I think I pointed this out last time as well, but it's worth pointing out once again, right? The positive side of the father is order, protection, community, structure. The negative side is the potential for tyranny. Apsu, remember, is a father figure, but he was also a tyrant who tried to destroy his children. You know, that type of father figure probably needs to be opposed. And that's what Ea did, right? You have the figures that become blind. The mother figure, same type of thing. There's positive side, right? They're nurturing. There's a sor the source of all potential, right? They're givers of life, right? The producers of all form. At the same time, they could have a negative characteristic of being destructive, as Tiamat clearly is, and chaotic. That's what she represents. But you could also think of the mother figure in a negative sense when it comes to... Um, like the Oedipus idea, which we talked about in our very first lecture, right? This idea of the devouring mother, the, the mother figure that doesn't allow the child to develop the right way, right? They kind of squash that development, and um, which causes all kinds of problems, kind of the um, you know, Hansel and Gretel and the, and the witch story or something along those lines. Okay, so you've got all these archetypes already in play. And then the motifs, like I was saying before, it's obviously a creation story, but the hero versus the dragon is the one that I wanted to point out. And it's worth noting only because it's happen it happens so many times in the stories we're going to read this semester. We had the hero fighting the serpent. You had the hero fighting the dragon. You know, this is, um, I don't want to say done to death. It's still one of the greatest things. Uh, I think, you know, I love movies like The Hobbit. Right um, back when I was a kid, I was I loved the movie Dragon Slayer, which is probably something most of you haven't heard of. Um, but that idea of you know the knight and the dragon, Saint George and the dragon, right? There's so many different versions of the story. It's one of the oldest stories, and here you have a great example of it being one of the oldest stories itself. Um, 
We could talk a lot about the symbolism of the dragon and, and various aspects of the dragon, but I'm probably going to hold that off because we will, like I said, deal with these types of motifs later this semester. Um, but again, here's a creation story that has a very serious hero motif built in. Now, why dragons? You know, why is a dragon one of the most recurring ideas? And it's, it's probably because the dragon is like the alpha, right? It's the alpha predator. This is the biggest, scariest um, opponent that you can deal with. And um, it's a real proof of one's skill and prowess as a hero, as a warrior, as a king. The uh, next most, I guess there's a couple other big animals that we could see. You know, the bull is going to be another big one as far as ancient combat. And then the lion. And I was just thinking the lion, as a matter of fact, this particular illustration has a lot of features that are uh, very much um, feline built in. As well. You know, it's obviously a composite animal, some bird features, some lion features and whatnot. But if you ever look at the art of ancient Mesopotamia among the um, Assyrians and the Persians and stuff like that, the lion is very prominent. You know, hunting scenes where the king is killing a lion, sometimes, you know, kind of a one-on-one -on -one thing. This is a symbol of power. It's a symbol of greatness. Right? You're a great hunter, you're a great warrior, you're a great ruler. They go hand in hand. Okay, let's go on a little bit further and talk about um, some of the things that, that go on in the story. Because now you have the creation, right? You have the, the creation of man, which follows the creation of the earth. So it's Tiamat's corpse that literally becomes the earth, which is why you can very realistically say she's a mother goddess. Um, the creation of man is also very interesting. He is created from the blood of Kingu um, and some other things that are, are mixed in. And he's created for a purpose, and that's kind of the interesting part. So it kind of brings me to where I wanted to go with this idea of functions. If you remember back when we talked about the various functions of myth, there are a few functions that um, I'm just going to bring up that we could talk about, such as the cosmological function. Now, the cosmological function, remember, has to do with how a story is going to give us uh, a picture of the ordered universe, uh, kind of help us construct a worldview and allow us to be able to answer kind of our, our general, uh, satisfy our general uh, curiosity about the nature of reality. So the story is clearly cosmological. As a creation myth, almost every creation myth is cosmological. As a matter of fact, you, when I used to teach this course and deal with uh, a lot more of the creation myth stuff directly, we would talk about all the different types of cosmological questions that went uh, that were, um, what's the word I'm trying to uh, come up with? The uh, stories would be addressing a, a certain collection of questions and uh, usually dealt with maybe five or six, what I'd call big cosmological questions. Um, this story answers a number of them. I'm not going to get into exactly what they are, but it's clearly a cosmology that it's trying to produce. Teleological function. That would be the function that has to do with supplying a community with a sense of purpose, meaning, um, a goal, or something along the lines. And that's where we get into this idea of the creation of man. Because in this story, the Enuma Elish is very specific about the role of man in creation. Because it directly tells us why man was created. Marduk creates man for the purpose of serving the gods. To be a slave to the gods. To farm and bring forth fruit and food to feed the gods and supply, you know, the, the upper echelon, the, uh, the hierarchy of the uh, beings above humanity, above the earth. Now, that might not be the type of function or purpose that would bring a great deal of sense of meaning and, and value to human life, but um, it's, it's very clear in the text what that purpose is. There's also a sociological uh, function, which is probably tied with that very uh, purpose. You know, man is seen as a, a slave of the gods is going to help you understand your role in society, or at least the role of many people within society. But the story itself also is supposed to show us a structure, right? Kind of um, a hierarchical arrangement of power. If you know anything about ancient Sumerian and Babylonian or Mesopotamian civilization, you know that the gods control everything. There's a kind of top-down power structure. The gods are supreme. The kings are kind of the uh, representatives of the gods and the intermediaries between gods and men. So it kind of gives us a picture of how society is supposed to be arranged. And you could also talk about the function of, you know, this goes back to G.S. Kirk's 
you know, threefold function, but operative is one of them. Uh, and the operative function has to do with the fact that these stories were meant to actually do something. And that's where I'm going to cross over and talk a little bit about theory, because this particular story had uh, some interesting ritual that went along with it. So when I talked about theories, I talked about, you know, the ritual theory of mythology, which says all myths are tied to ancient ritual in some ways. And this one definitely was. We know for a fact that the story of the Numa Elish was connected with a ritual and a festival that took place at the beginning of the new year for the ancient Babylonians. It was called the Ikitu Festival. Um, now, the Ikitu Festival, I forget how many days exactly it went on. It was like 9 to 11 days long. And it involved a number of interesting things, such as the king, you know, it's like the end of the year, right? So when the new year takes place, the end of the year, the beginning of the new year, the king would be brought before the god, accused of various crimes. He'd have his crown removed. He'd actually be struck. And he would then have to plead his innocence and his faithfulness and um, his crown would then be reinstated. He'd basically be re-coronated and set up for rule again. So it's like a rebirth of the kingship. Now, remember, it's a creation story. So by retelling, and not just retelling, they actually acted out the battle between Marduk and Tiamat as part of this festival. Um, that whole idea of acting out the creation, acting out the struggle that brings about the creation at the beginning of the new year was, in a sense, a, a magic ritual to renew the year for us. It's like a new creation. It's a new start. It's a new beginning. You should bring forth, again, new life and fertility, which is really why the new year was generally acknowledged in the first place, is because it marked the beginning of the planting season. So this was a myth definitely tied to ritual, tied to new beginnings, tied to creation. Um, it's kind of interesting how they did that, but it was also political um, and kind of fits with the charter theory, uh, which again, the charter theory, if you don't remember what that is, it says that myth serves as a way to not only explain sort of institutions, but also to validate, you know, institutions like kingship and uh, government structure and various things like that. So not only do you have this idea of the, you know, the installment of a king at the beginning of the year, but you've got the idea of the political structure reinforced throughout the entire empire, because one of the other aspects of the Akitu festival would be the bringing of the cult statues from various temples throughout Mesopotamia, uh, the other gods, basically, to Babylon by Bard, where the statues would be placed in council in front of the statue of Marduk. And it is it was a very visual representation of an actual political reality, right? All the gods bow to the god Marduk, just the way all of the cities in the empire bow to the capital at Babylon, okay? Their god is the chief, and their city is you know, the ruler of all. So very powerful imagery um, that we get from that. Again, the creative era theory, I think I talked a little bit about that, probably the least out of all the theories that we did bring up in the initial lecture, but um, this is Mercilliade's um, theory that has to do with this idea of returning us back to the creative moment, right? This is the idea of uh, attaching ourselves again to that beginning point so that you could... Um, you know, re-experience a new creation, okay, to keep the world functioning the way it was meant to from the very beginning. So again, it's, a, it's kind of a transport back in time in a certain sense, uh, religiously speaking. Now, I'm going to get to the biblical creation in a second. Let me not advance the slide just yet because I wanted to point out one more time about the names. I promised you that when we got through all this stuff near the end of the poem, uh, actually close to the end of the poem. There's actually quite a bit after. But you get to this point where they give Marduk a collection of names. It's actually given 50 names, which kind of balances out this idea at the beginning of the poem where nothing is named. And then by the end of the poem, Marduk is not only the one who has just conquered the threat and saved all of the gods, created the earth, created man, but he is supreme as king of all. And he is given these names which kind of exalt him and show his great power, right? This idea of there being complete order that Marduk brings about. And this idea of naming gods is not um, something unknown even today. If you're familiar with the religion of Islam, um, as a matter of fact, the god Allah doesn't just have 50 names. He outdoes Marduk by a great deal. Um, Allah has 99 names that he is known by. Okay, so Marduk, this, this goes all the way back to the Babylonians, this idea of multiple names um, showing his 
multiple roles, his power and all that kind of stuff. Okay. That's kind of a quick, quick summary of the new Middle East. Kind of hate going through it that fast. Um, because there's probably a lot more that we could actually unpack in the story. But what I'm going to do now is we're going to progress to ancient Israel. We're going to take a look at a story that was written by the Hebrew scribes. It's the story of Adam and Eve. You were supposed to read uh, Genesis chapters 2 and 3, but I'm going to start back just a little bit prior by taking a look at Genesis 1. So let's take a look at the biblical creation story in the first book of the Torah. And I've got some of the first few lines laid out here, and I want to point out just some of the big differences off the bat and some of the similarities. This is one of the things that you want to do when you study myth is, is pay attention to both of those things. So it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. gets to the point a little bit faster than the Enuma Elish. We don't see the creation of the heavens and the earth in the Enuma Elish until after Marduk has destroyed Tiamat. Second verse says, Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Here you've got the chaos, right? Formlessness. You've got water. You've got a lot of the same things that I just talked about. Tiamat represents both, right? The water, the formlessness. So even in the biblical creation story, you've got the chaos. But you also have a God who is then going to impose order. And in verse 3, it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. So here you have the idea of creation, not through conflict, not through war, not through a God destroying another being and ripping it apart and fashioning something out of it like a craftsman, but you've got an architect who is speaking things into existence. So here you've got this idea, again, of the words, right? The idea of bringing order through speech. And I know when I talked about chaos in the uh, lecture on trickster heroes, I talked a lot about the idea of um, understanding and knowing and the importance of form in coming to know and the impossibility of comprehending that which is chaotic. Okay, so here you've got a very different creation account. You've got a creation account really without struggle, which is kind of interesting. Now, this story, I think, is written the way it's written as a response to some of the ideas in other cultures around Israel. And I'm sure that the biblical author was well aware of kind of the Babylonian Sumerian accounts, right? Um, it's also going to be something that is going to be in some ways a response to some of the creation stories that come out of Egypt, which we're going to look at in the next lecture. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out in the beginning. Now, again, what I want to get to is Genesis chapters 2 and 3, because that's where we're going to be introduced to our trickster hero. Actually, I shouldn't call it a trickster hero in this case, but at least our trickster. Okay, so here, again, the mediation of opposites. You have an actual order without struggle, as I was saying a second ago. All right, the trickster. Um, and, and I apologize for calling him the trickster hero, uh, we talked about trickster heroes, but I know I pointed out in the trickster lecture that the trickster is not only the precursor to the hero, but also the precursor to the villain. And here is one of the great um, examples of the villainous trickster, the serpent. This is probably the most famous trickster figure in all of world literature, bar none. Now, Genesis chapters 2 and 3 are going to focus on the creation of Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, and ultimately the fall of man. So let's talk about Adam and Eve briefly. Here are your first two humans that are put into this garden, which is essentially a paradise, right? Um, and they're given the ability to eat. They don't have to really work to bring forth food, but they get to eat that which is present in the garden with a few exceptions, okay? And the exception would be one particular tree. So... Let me go down. There we go. Now, I'm going to actually just bring up all these, these slides here so that I don't miss anything that I wanted to talk about. It's not the tree of knowledge. Uh, actually, it is the tree of knowledge. I'm so sorry. Um, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, specifically. For some reason, I was thinking that said the tree of life. I wasn't paying attention to what I had on my own PowerPoint. Okay, so the tree of knowledge. Now, this is the one tree that they're not allowed to eat from. Okay, it specifically says in chapter 2 that 
God commanded man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. Very specific. There's a consequence for eating of this one tree. Now, what happens next is we're introduced finally to the serpent. The text says, Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Sorry, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. And when the man called every living, uh, and whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Okay, and the man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every burst, uh, bird. I'm sorry, to every beast of the field. Now that obviously isn't introducing the, the serpent. The serpent comes in in the beginning of chapter three. Um, and I'm reading this for a very particular reason. I'm just not being very clear about it. Um, in the beginning of chapter 3, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. So we've already talked about the creation of the beast and the naming of the beast. And the reason I was reading that first part was uh, I wanted to point out again this idea of naming. Uh, in the text, um, it talks about Adam naming the beasts, right? Naming the animals. It's kind of a job that he's been given. Um, and here also you have this idea of Creation and naming going hand in hand. This idea of order and this idea of Adam being somewhat of a sub-creator and the role of naming the animals. He's kind of pointing out what they are. He's recognizing um, their natures. He's, he's naming them and ordering the universe in a certain way so that it's very clear what everything is. So Adam has a hand in this. And this is very reminiscent of what we saw in the Enuma Elish, this idea of namelessness and then later having names brought about. So I just wanted to point out that the Hebrew Scriptures have interesting attention to this idea of naming as well, not just with God creating, but also with Adam having the role as naming. Okay, now all of, out of all those creatures, here we have the serpent, and that's the one that we're going to focus on. Now the serpent, according to tradition, is going to be characterized later as Satan or the devil. Um, it doesn't really name him as such in the actual text of the scriptures. Um, you actually see the interesting uh, character of Satan or the adversary later on, particularly in the book of Job and some other places down the road. Now the interesting thing about the serpent is he is going to be deceitful. He's going to be tricky. It says in the very first line when they introduce him that he's more crafty, right? The intellect is the primary characteristic of the trickster. And he says to woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now pay attention to the question because he's right. God didn't actually say that, okay? So he's not being very clearly well, I guess that's the whole point of good deception, right? You're not clearly lying. You're saying something that's partially true, but it's the response of the woman that's also interesting because she says, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And then the serpent says, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So there he's getting um, to the actual core of the lie. But it's interesting. The trickster, like we said, was a character that kind of pushes the boundaries, right? They stand up to the father figure. They stand up to the culture. They're a transformative figure. And sometimes the culture needs to be pushed a little bit. You need to question certain things. You need to challenge those boundaries. But here is the quintessential example of the trickster challenging the father figure. God, of course, in the text, being the archetypal father. Okay, the one who has created all of the order that is now being challenged by the serpent. And as the serpent is pushing the boundaries and testing the limits, notice it becomes very easy to push those boundaries when those boundaries aren't very clear, at least in the mind of the person the serpent is addressing. I think God was very clear earlier in the text about what the boundaries are, that you're not allowed to eat of that one tree, because if you eat of it, then you'll surely die. But the woman doesn't seem to know that. She's vague. She's confused about exactly what those boundaries are, which makes it very easy to deceive her, right? Because what she says is that you're not only supposed to not eat it, you're not even supposed to touch it, okay? And that's clearly not what God said earlier in the chapter. Okay, so she doesn't know what the rules exactly are. And, of course, Satan takes advantage of that. 
right? He pushes the boundaries and then challenges her and then gets her thinking. And then, of course, he gets her to give in to the temptation to eat. She gives it to her husband. He eats. And the next thing that we have, of course, is finally the fall, right? Now, the interesting thing is they eat of the fruit and they don't die immediately. But when we talk about death, remember, death has multiple interpretations, right? Death is a metaphor for all kinds of things that we're going to look at throughout the semester. One of them being the moment of transition from one state to another, right? Putting behind a certain past and moving on to the future. Uh, the idea of dying and rising. The idea of uh, moving away as you mature. The type of death. The hero stories. We're going to talk a lot about that idea. Now, in the sense, in the text, there's, there's really a literal death that's implied. That man is not going to live forever. That man actually is going to physically die, but they don't die at the moment. A type of death that they do have at that moment is a separation from God and a separation from their previous state of innocence and a way, an un unawareness of themselves. Because it's at that moment that you have the beginning of human self consciousness. Because immediately they realize that they're naked and it says they were ashamed and they go about covering themselves. Human beings are self-conscious. We also talked about, you know, the greatest fear that we have as human beings is the fear of people kind of looking through us and seeing the real us, the idea of public speaking and being exposed in a certain way. And this is really one of the first stories where you've got that idea of this fear of being exposed. What they do is they cover themselves, they hide themselves, which is exactly what everybody always does when we put on our persona and we put on our mask and we go into public. There is a side of us that we show to the public. There's another side that we hide away, right? This is that moment of self-consciousness. Now, of course, things get worse as they try to hide from God. God knows where they are and there's going to be an enmity that's put between them and the serpent. They kind of account for, you know, this, the animosity between humans and serpents. So here again, you've got this idea of the, the struggle between the serpent and the human being. Very, again, reminiscent of Marduk versus Tiamat, the archetypal motif. But then you've got the casting out of the garden, right? The ultimate penalty is a loss of paradise. At the end of chapter 3, the Lord God said, Behold... The man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore, the Lord sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword and turned away, sorry, turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So there's this um, border, a boundary, a new boundary placed up, right, that you're not supposed to transgress across. Now, this image of this garden of paradise, um, usually where there is a tree of life, um, often guarded by a serpent, this is a motif that we're going to see in a number of stories we're going to read later this semester as well. And it's usually set up at this place where there's uh, kind of this boundary experience, kind of at the ex limit of the world. Um, we'll talk about that motif, we'll unpack the meaning of that motif, but here you have it in the Hebrew scriptures again, okay? A number of archetypal images that are worth noting, obviously the garden, the tree, the serpent and dragon, that's what I was talking about before I even brought the visual up, okay? So here we've got two stories that we've just looked at, unfortunately too quickly, the Enuma Elish, where you have this conflict, Marduk and Tiamat, kind of the hero and the dragon motif, in the midst of a creation story, bring order out of chaos. And then the story that we have in Genesis, which is much more peaceful. We don't have the conflict in the creation, but we do have the conflict emerge in the fall story between Adam and Eve and the serpent, or even between God and the serpent, because that's where the real tension is, which costs man everything and is going to set up um, you know, the future existence of human beings. Now, next lecture, we're going to be moving on kind of doing part two of this, Creation, Conflict, and Cunning, where we, get, where, where we are going to be looking at the creation myths of ancient Egypt, uh, particularly the story of Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Okay, so hopefully you'll be back for that lecture. Um, most of the time, the students really love the story of Osiris. Um, it tends to be a little bit more relatable than the story of the Enuma Elish, but um, I'll let you guys decide for yourselves. 
but do read the story of Osiris, Isis, and Horus before the next lecture, and I will talk to you then.